Hi, Misha here, and this is my first look at the Lockheed Martin F-35 Lightning II, also known as the Joint Strike Fighter, JFS, and uh, I'm sure I will revisit this, so this is most likely one of two, but I just kind of felt like putting the versions side by side and talking a little bit about them. There's a lot to be said. On the left here, we have the original F-35A, primarily used by Air Force. The American, this one here from Hobby Master, is from the Australian Air Force. This is a conventional takeoff and landing version. Then we have the F 35B. This is a short takeoff and landing or vertical landing version. And I have this one set up in the landing mode. This is used by the U.S. Marines as well as operators of smaller carriers like the British, taking place of Harriers. And then we have the most recent version to go into service, the F-35C, which is designed for use by the U.S. Navy and other naval users. It's designed to take off and land on carriers, and so it has some changes geared at that. All of these models are Hobby Master, 172 scale, die cast. I considered maybe getting an Air Force One just to break it up, but then I just figured it'd be better to have kind of all of the same. Oh boy. The the JFS program is the largest and most expensive single military program in history, at least to date. And it has been criticized and boy that's there's a lot to that. It dates back all the way to nineteen ninety two when the concept began of essentially having a one-size-fits-all fighter. There's something about the U.S. government where they just really want this one-size-fits-all whatever it is. Yeah. The concept was where they could share parts, training, and other logistics, and they can be modified as needed for specific users. To that end, it was always intended to have these three versions, especially the B. Well, the program really came down to the X-32 and the X-35. The X-35 first flew in 2000, it won, and the prototype of the F-35 first flew in 2006, it was the A model, so the most standard of these. And from there, these were supposed to be in service in a couple of years. And honestly, are just now coming into service as we speak, 2019. In fact, the C just came into service just a few months ago. Now, I know in the comments there will probably be some things about all the rigmarole. I'm not ignoring it, it's just... It's late and I'm tired, so I just want to talk a little bit about the stats. These are designed to have low cost and easy, or at least easier, to maintain stealth technology. To that end, they have an internal weapons bay. They have two of them. Each bay can hold two armaments, although future versions might expand that to three. And then in addition... You can hold weapons 
on external pylons on the wings and we can do three per wing but of course this decreases the stealthiness so it is a trade-off it is a single seat single engine fighter while it is quite small it's actually quite heavy it's very thick a very chunky bird it is supersonic including the B it can get up to at least 1.6 Mach it has a ceiling of about 53,000 feet give or take the A and the C versions can carry about 2,000 pounds in the internal base. The B version, because of its vertical capability, can only carry 1,000. It also has a shorter range and some other limitations. However, it is still one of the best performing vertical aircraft manufactured to date. These are primarily designed and tested by Lockheed Martin. However, Northrop Grumman has contributed many critical components and many foreign users contribute components or accessories or modules or whatever. And the idea with the F-35 is that pretty much anywhere in the world one of these can fly in, land there, and they will have the components to keep it running, be it an A, B, or C. Also the idea is that maintenance is easy, just opening up bays, pulling out modules, putting in modules in. Of course the reality is not that simple. This is an extremely complex machine. It doesn't use a heads-up display, HUD, instead it uses a fancy pants helmet which itself costs tens of thousands maybe even hundreds of thousands net by now dollars per helmet it uses lithium ion batteries which is funny because you're not supposed to fly on planes with those so yeah as I said it's stealth technology and of course a lot of its features are still classified or just kind of vaguely stated well, that's the general gist. These are in service. To date, about 380 have been produced in total. The U.S. government claims it's going to purchase 2,663 and essentially replace the majority of other frontline jet aircraft. So they're really wanting to put all their eggs in one basket. These are capable, of course, of carrying a wide range of air-to-air, -air, air to surface missiles, bombs, electronic countermeasures, pretty much anything. They, they're meant to be where they can pretty much stuff anything they want in here. They're even working on a cruise missile, the JSM, which is uh, kind of the brainchild of the Australians. So it would be interesting to see a craft like this launching a cruise missile. Well, let's get a little bit up close with each of these and then We'll see where we're at from there. First up with the F-35A. This is kind of the most vanilla <laughs> of the variants. And it was honestly the last model I picked up. And really it was because I'm a completionist and also I got it on a kind of good deal on sale. So why not? This is fifty and a half feet long, so quite small for a modern fighter. It has a relatively short wingspan of thirty five feet, one engine in the back, as I said, although it is one of, if not the most powerful engine ever put in a jet fighter. It has those 
six hard points under the wings. The 35A has an internal 25 millimeter Gatlin type cannon with 180 rounds. As I said, the prototype of this first flew in 2006 and was really what they first really worked on. The Air Force started taking delivery in 2000. 10 started to really work with these in 2011. There's a whole thing of uh, issues and fixes and groundings and flying again. But in August of 2016, the Air Force declared its F 35A operational. And since that time, a few of the Air Forces have done the same, including our friends with Australia here as well as the Israelis. This is indeed the basic F-35 version. And pretty much performs as you would expect. Let's move on. The F-35B. Certainly a more interesting looking plane. This is designed for short takeoff and landing. It can also operate vertically. To, z to do so, it has a thrust vectored nozzle on the back that could point down as needed and then angle back up for normal flight it also has a fan in the front act as a counterbalance for the engine. This doesn't have its own engine, it's actually linked to the main engine with the gearbox. And there are also little thrust nozzles under each wing which can be opened up to control during low speed flight. So there's quite a bit of components that open up. <laughs> this ability comes at the cost of fuel. It cannot hold as much. It also cannot lift as much. Like I said, it can only carry a thousand pounds per bay instead of two thousand. And if you really want to use the vertical feature, it needs to be lighter loaded. That said, this is still the world's first supersonic vertical jet, at least successful one. It was initially not fitted with a cannon, but then a gun pod was designed to fit under the belly. And interestingly, the gun pod itself was designed to be stealthy, low profile so they were still concerned about that these would be used by the marines to support ground troops and could take off and operate from primitive or virtually non-existent airfields the 35B prototype first flew in 2008 and by 2010 they were working with and testing the vertical system but as you would expect it wasn't always easy going by 2012 the Marine Corps were starting to receive its first fighters and by 2013 they were starting to operate with them test them and even tinker with the vertical system 
Interestingly, when they first got these, they were not not allowing their pilots to use them, but more recently they've cleared them for use. And finally, in July of 2015, the Marines declared the F-35B operational, but again, others debate if this is really correct. These are also used by the British. This model here is actually patterned after the British version. And it's pretty interesting, pretty, pretty neat. Well, let's move on to our final version. And now the F-35C for the Navy. This is the largest version. The first two we looked at were 50 and a half feet by 35 wingspan. This one here is a little bit longer at 50.8 feet, but it has a much longer, wider wingspan at 43. This was done to allow for better performance on carriers. Also, having a larger wing gives it a larger fuel capacity and thus more range. Is also, of course, fitted with the tail hook for carrier operations. So it's probably the best performing of the three. Now, the Navy wasn't real keen on the F-35. They seemed quite happy with their F-A-18s and F-A-18 Super Hornets and... Uh, yeah, they were kind of a little bit uh, slower. The 35C, the Navy version, the prototype first flew in 2010, so after the other two. And then they started working with simulated carrier takeoff and landings in 2011 and quickly figured out that the original tail hook designed for this was complete crap. It did not work reliably and safely, so Lockheed had to redesign the tail hook system, and they delivered an updated version to the Navy in 2013. And so again in 2014, they began working with carrier trials and then had the first actual carrier landings with these. But as with the other ones, there are still other issues and problems. And actually, the Navy did not declare the F-35C operational until February of this year, February of 2019. So it is the last to be declared operational. Its wings can fold, by the, by the way, for storage on board carriers. As I said earlier, the government plans to purchase over 2,600 of these. They plan to keep buying them through at least 2037. And they claim that these will be in service and be a viable tool, a viable weapon, until 2070. Pretty damn lofty, considering that the whole idea dates back to 1992. So at 2070, they'll be, at least the concept will be 80 years old. And the first prototype will have flown 60 years before that. Right now, that's hard to imagine a jet remaining valid. It's also hard to imagine our government not getting into some new flashy, shiny jet between now and then. I, I don't think it'll happen. This project has been considered too big to fail. I'd say at this point that's true. Again, there's a lot of detractors of this. And uh, honestly, most of them make a great point. I'm not going to argue. But 
But that's not really the topic of this video. I just wanted to put the three Hobby Master versions side by side. Funnily enough, I bought them kind of in reverse. I bought the C when they first came out. Then I bought the B. And recently I just got the A in. Again, it was on sale. And I figured, eh, at this point, why the hell not? <laughs> I, th I think the C is my favorite. It's the heaviest because of the wider wing. It's the more metal feeling. The B is probably the most interesting. There's a lot to do to transform its modes. I don't know which one I'll leave it in. I kept it in this mode because I know I'll be doing this video, so it's been in this mode for a few weeks. But once it, I'm done, I may put it back in regular flight mode because there's a lot sticking out. and Yeah. It's interesting, though. And again, as far as the A, it just came in. I like that it's Australian. That's kind of neat. And in a lot of ways, it is the basic version. So it is what it is. Neat for what they are. One way or the other, this is definitely a plane with history, good or bad. It has definitely made its mark on history. I don't think anyone could argue otherwise. Seems like yesterday the uh, F-22 Raptor was the new hot thing, but times move on. Like I said, I'll get more into the development later on. But I just wanted to compare these tonight. Just kind of felt the mood. Any questions or comments? Welcome on below. If you could, like, share, and subscribe. And as I remind you at the end of these videos, if you're interested in a model yourself, you can use product code MISHA, M-I-S-H-A, to save 15% off at Pete's Collectibles. Links in the description. We're not partners or anything. I don't get a kickback or anything. He's just been helpful to me. So I like to return the favor when someone's nice to me. I try and, you know, get him back just because. So, um, yeah. If you might like one for yourself. Much obliged. Alrighty. This is Misha. And I'll catch you very soon next time.